Have you ever heard anyone say, God bless, whenever they hear of something or see something? You see, today we are going to be talking about what exactly we must do in order to be blessed and how God blesses us. You see, some most people seem to think that God's blessings are about health, wealth, and protection. But you see, God's blessings are not that limited. His gifts do include supplying for our material needs, but, he, but they do extend much further than that. So, today, I'm going to be tell, talking about the Beatitudes, the so-called Beatitudes that are found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. You see, the words Beatitude is not found anywhere in the entire Bible. So, why do we call it the Beatitudes? They are called the Beatitudes because they are the blessings that God himself has promised us. Each sentence begins with the word blessed. The English expression for this condition comes from the root word beautify. Beautify means to make better or to be improved. As you read the Beatitudes, you will see that attitude is key to receiving these blessings. And you see, people's attitude are what direct their decision-making process, which then determines their acts and will either make them good or bad. You see, each one of these Beatitudes is kind of like a stepping stone that leads to the next Beatitude, which causes you to have a new attitude which will soon affect what type of blessing that you will receive. The Beatitudes are also unique because they are the blessings that are given to you not necessarily by your works, but by your attitude. You see, in Matthew chapter 5, 3 through 12, the so-called Beatitudes, here Jesus is going all about Galilee, teaching in, the, the syn in their synagogues, preaching the gospel and healing all kinds of sickness and disease from among the people. Then his fame began to spread all throughout Sierra, and they brought him the sick and those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains and demon-possessed people, and he had healed them, and great crowds began to follow him. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, Now seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. Now, it does not make you wonder, why did Jesus go up on the mountain? Was it to get away from the crowds? Was it to enjoy the view and, in, and to get to breathe the mountain air? You see, he had been doing a lot of traveling, preaching, and healing people. So he probably just wanted to go somewhere, where he could sit down, relax, and be able to look out and see the places where he had been to, and even possibly start to plan where he would go next. But anyway, he went up on the mountaintop. You see, Jesus by nature had a tendency to go up on mountains. Something about the mountains Jesus liked. He would go up them and pray on them. But this time he went up on the mountain to teach. And then it says, And he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, This is the start of the so-called Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. 
So now let's take these, these so-called Beatitudes and let's look at them closer so we can understand their meaning better. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor. The poor. I thought the poor, are they blessed? Everybody does, says God blessed when they see poor people. So why does it say blessed are the poor? You see, poor means being without. Even in Jesus' time, the poor had nothing. They were despite paupers, beggars, who were very dependent on others. So, blessed are the poor in spirit. Your spirit includes your attitude about yourself and life. You see, modern life today teaches us to be independent and self-sufficient. This beatitude says you are to be devoid of the spirit so that you can become totally dependent on God. Jesus' message here is that when you become small in your own eyes, you are ready to become dependent on God. So it is, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for, they shall, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is to, the basic point here, is to recognize our spiritual poverty. Then it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So first we recognize our spiritual poverty. See, the cause of this mourning is the recognition of our spiritual condition. And it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, meek can imply an attitude of weakness towards someone. Meek is not stuck up. See, meek is one who is strong, but not violent. One who is able to endure injury with patience and without resentment. It is one who is secure, humble, and unassuming. Jesus called himself meek and gentle. A person, a meek person, is a person who is able to handle conflicts and insults without having an ego crisis. The meek, but it says the meek shall inherit the earth. But what is the earth? I mean, there is more than one meek person on the earth. There's actually many meek people on the earth. But how can the meek inherit the earth? There is only one planet earth. So how can all these people inherit it? Well, here the word earth means the realm of your existence. It is the place and circumstances of your life. Have you ever been around someone who continuously bragged about how good they are, or how good they are at something, or how good something is? An example, a modern day example of this, would be TV commercials, politicians, New and used car sales, just for an example. See, most of the time, these things aren't even half as good as they said they were, or these people may not have been as good as what, as what they led you on to believe that they would be. You see, meek people don't necessarily have to tell you, because people can already tell that. Let me give you an example. You see, I'm a paintball player. A paintball is a game where you go out in the woods and you shoot at each other with guns. So one day, I was playing paintball. Me and my buddy were very experienced paintball players. We were playing against several other beginning players. So we stacked the teams so that, it that it, their team would be a lot bigger than ours, so that it would be more fair. You see, our team beat them several times, so we decided to have mercy on them and to give them all our guys so that it would make them feel better. So it was about five or six guys against us two. You see, we beat them five games in a row. By the sixth game, me and my buddy got really braggy. We started bragging like crazy. We hadn't been shot anymore or even if 
three times the entire day. We had beat them. We just got done beating them several times. And then we easily beat them five games in a row when it was only two of us against all of them. So, before the sixth game, me and my buddy did not even bother with forming a strategy for beating them. We spent the entire time talking about how there was no way that they would ever be able to beat us that game. See, that game, we lost really bad. We got beat in less than five minutes. And they shot us good. So we spent the next few days in pain because of it. But that day we learned the lesson the hard way. No matter how good your reputation is, and no matter how good you are at something, or even after you've done it, do not brag about it. In Matthew 20, 16, it says that the last will be first and the first will be last. And then the next beatitude is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You see, hungering is discomfort caused by lack of necessary nutrients. Thirsting is in strong need for life-sustaining fluid. Hungry and thirsting puts all the other needs into the back of your mind. Have you ever been on vacation or in some type of predicament where you had to skip a meal or several meals and that you not find yourself saying that or thinking or saying that I must have something to eat or drink now? It's not comfortable. Um, you see, there are some reasons for hungering and thirsting. Here's one. It's because you haven't eaten yet, or you didn't eat enough to fulfill your hunger. Here's another one. Your body is in need of energy because it isn't used at all. Or, it's because you're bored and you're in the habit of eating because you're bored. You see, to hunger and to thirst is in present tense, which signifies continual actions for it to be obtained. When damage is done to one's spiritual life, it is their Christian nature that will cause their soul to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, righteousness is the food and drink of our very own spiritual health. You see, everyone imagines their motives as pure. Ask anyone why they made a particular decision, and they will always give you a righteous answer. I mean, have you ever heard someone say, I did that just to be mean, ugly, and stupid. Not very often. So the next beatitude it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And the next beatitude is to, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's, these, this is one of those beatitudes that is, As you sow, shall, so shall you reap. See, mercy is compassion, pity, symphony, kindness, or forgiveness. It's shown especially to someone that someone else has power over. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, pure means not mixed with any other substance. Clean and free from impurities and sheer or complete. Most people don't think about how pure they are very often. Why? You see, the very reason why we should think about our purity is the very reason why most people would rather not think about it. You see, purity to God takes mental concentration and dedication to an unseen God who rewards you in private that it is hard for most people to comprehend this, which also makes it difficult for most people to concentrate on their spiritual activities along with their dedication to it. Yet, this very activity lets you begin to see God. Now, but how can I see God? I mean, if we look at 1 John 4, 12 through 15, 
It says, No man has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us His own Spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son as a Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. And in John 1, 1, 18, it says, Only the Son has seen God. So if no man has ever seen God, then how can I see God? You will not only see, but also feel His existence, His power, His reality, and nature abiding in and around you. Blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Then it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You see, peacemakers are to never retaliate. They are to remove their selfish desires and their hostilities toward others. Jesus told us not to return evil with evil, but to turn the other cheek instead. Do what is asked of you and forgive others. We are to love unconditionally and always treating others the way we would want to be treated. You see, peace begins with our personal attitudes and our personal behaviors. That's how peace begins. Here are some tips for peacemaking. How to make peace. Be alert and watchful of surrounding situations and actions. Prevent conflicts before they happen. Because once the conflict starts, it will be much more difficult to make peace. Here's an important one. Try listening to others. When you do this, you will find that not only will you feel good inside, but you will also be helping the other person find peace. Let me give you an example. See, one day I was at the high school and there was a fellow classmate who was excessively mad at his group of friends that he had had for a long time. A few days passed, and he was still mad at them. He was so mad at them, he didn't even want to sit anywhere around them at lunch. He didn't even want to sit facing them in the cafeteria. So he asked if he could sit at our table. And we said, okay. Um... And he sat down, and we could tell that he was real upset. You see, we already knew what he was mad about, but we asked him questions and eventually got him to vent to us about what was bothering him and why he was so upset at his group of friends. We spent the entire lunch that day listening to him talk about it. Two hours later, that same day, that young man walked up to his friends and they talked. By the next day, they were the same group of friends that they had always been. The next day at lunch, he had returned to the same old table that he had always sat at with his friends. And me and my friends felt good inside because we knew, because we took the time out of our day to stop and just let him tell us about how he was feeling when no one else was. <clears throat> you see, sometimes, just, sometimes people just need to get whatever it is that's bothering them off their chest by venting to other people that will listen to them. When they do this, they should start to get over whatever it is that is bothering them, causing peace. Just by listening to others, you can be a peacemaker. And you see, peacemakers, and it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Then it said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On my account, rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Now you are becoming righteous 
which means you have been behaving in a manner that God would want you to behave. And he has told you to behave. See, the righteous have formed the right attitude that God is pleased with. You see, when I think of righteousness, I think of a waterfall. I think of righteousness as a waterfall. Because you can just watch a waterfall and know that it's powerful just by watching it. Same with righteousness. You can see it, just watch a righteous person, and you can tell that they are a righteous person. Same thing with meek. See, true righteousness is something that people can see and detect easily. It cannot be hidden. But then it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, why would people persecute a righteous person? You see, when an unrighteous person sees a righteous person, they begin to feel that the righteous person is better and more pleasing to God than themselves. Then the less righteous person will begin to persecute the one that they feel is more righteous than themselves. This type of persecution can happen from fellow Christians as well as from non-Christians. Remember, this is the same type of feeling that caused Cain to kill Abel. You see, persecution because of righteousness means that you are living your life right for Christ in a way that others can see your love and dedication to God. So they will either look up to you as an example or they will begin to persecute you because of it. Which will cause them to have a burning desire to ruin your level of righteousness. So they will try anything possible to make you look bad. They might reveal you and set you up by putting you on the spot in front of others and or uttering all kinds of evil against you so falsely for your service to God. And then it says, to rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Now, what does it mean to be re to rejoice and be exceedingly glad? I don't know if we really know what that means anymore. You see, rejoice means to show great happiness about something, and glad means to be delighted, happy, and pleased. Let me give you an example. Um, have you ever been somewhere, and someone runs up to you, and they are say, I am so glad you came. It is also willing and ready to do something. Have you ever helped someone and they say thank you and you replied with, I am always glad to help. It is grateful and appreciate it is grateful and appreciative for something. Have you ever been at work and come home, sit down in your chair, turn the television on, and finally get a chance to just take it easy? Do you not notice that most of the time when people do that, they, are, they always usually say, I am so glad to have a chance to relax. This is what rejoice and glad mean. So it says, rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. But what is a reward? You see, a reward must be earned, which requires work in order to receive it. It is not given, it's not just handed to you, you have to work in order to get it. I was going down the road a couple of days ago, and I saw a big semi with, in big letters, it had the words Marines put it on the side of the semi. And right under that, it said, earned, never given. You see, in order to get a reward, we must spend time working toward that goal. And once we accomplish that goal, we get the reward of that goal. You see... Then it says that they persecuted the prophets that were before you. You see, God loves righteous people. In Romans 8, 35-39, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For it is written, For thy sakes we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered persecution. No, and then it says, no, 
in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, some of these Beatitudes might be hard for you. But you see, whatever God asks you to do, He will empower you to do. Remember that. You see, all of these, step, all of these Beatitudes in Matthew 5 through 12 are like stepping stones. They all fit together to form cause and effect and also effect cause relationships. Let me explain how they all fit together. The first beatitude causes you to recognize your spiritual poverty. The effect of this is found in the second beatitude that causes you to mourn over your condition. This causes you to accept God's yoke in the third beatitude, which affects you by making you hunger and thirst for righteousness in the fourth beatitude. This craving for righteousness causes you to extend mercy to others in the fifth beatitude. The cause of this mercy is purity of heart in the sixth beatitude, which causes you to become a peacemaker in the seventh beatitude. And in the eighth beatitude is the effect which is persecution and the kingdom of heaven. So, the question here today is, are you ready to obey the gospel? To do that, you must believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. You must repent of your sins and turn completely away from them. You must be willing to confess with your mouth your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And you must be baptized into water so that your sins will be forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to serve Him all the days of your life and to obey His Word?